Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And welcome to the training, understanding the importance of integration of gender equality, disability, and social inclusion lens into your work. Um, summer net training for early and mid-career researchers from all background. It's a really great pleasure to have you all here today. My name is Kai Su, and I'm in the Summer Net Game Professionals um, uh, Network here at SEI. Uh, today, we have an exciting agenda highly tailored to our early and mid-career professionals, where we will be exploring core concepts of JETC and introducing some resources and tools, and also having some focus group breakout sections to discuss um, details and, and some reflection sections. Now, without further delay, it is my great honor to welcome our esteemed opening speaker, Dr. Chantana. Dr. Chantana is the chairperson of Summerna Steering Committee, and she has an extensive academic career spanning decades and expertise lines in democracy, conflict resolutions, social changes, among many others. And um, now, Dr. Chantana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hun Kaisu, for a uh, good introduction. Good afternoon, Sawadika, distinguished young participants. And uh, our speakers, Dr. C. Koza, Jetsi Advisor, and Kun Suwanarong, Team Jetsi Fellow. On behalf of Summonet Steering Committee, I would like to welcome you to Summonet Young Professional Training today on understanding the importance of integration of gender equality, disability, and social inclusion. Jetsi Lens into your work. That's a long title. <laughs> I trust that we are about to learn and lead a very important step towards inclusive policy development. To achieve a good policy and you will need a good research that bring us closer to the realities of the unequal society and we are that we are living in. We will need to understand better the intersectionality of vulnerability. Training on JETSI is an invention that combines the linkages of possible social inclusion, not only a single uh, type of exclusion. I believe with an appropriate lens for social investigation and research can be helpful and make the ideal becomes the practical. I hope the participant will have a happy learning session and anticipate your active participation. I would like on behalf of Summonet to thank CEDA and uh, SEI for making this important event possible and much appreciation to MTT and our speakers for their contribution, wisdom and uh, valuable time. Most of all, I have to congratulate the participants from all fields who shown the interest in learning and leading the application of gender lens, jet -Z lens in uh, their work. And I hope that you will follow and support our summit young professional activities in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chantana, for this encouraging uh, remark and your presence means a lot to us. Um, with that inspiring start, uh, let's move on to do a little fun exercise to get to know each other with uh, our Summer Net Game Professionals, Lee Buonao Latuli. You can start. Hello. Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us on our training today. Um, before we go into the contents of the training, I'd just like to do a little bit of rain check with everyone in the um, participation right now. Uh, if you could, let me share the screen. Um, we're going to do a little bit of activity to just talk about the um your day and also get a little bit to see how everyone's doing today so 
share I'll share the screen. Uh just give me a moment. Oh, okay. Just give me a moment. Okay. So if everyone could please just scan this QR code here on the left side and let us know. Sorry. Okay. Let us know how are you feeling today. Um, so scan the QR code on the left hand side and just type in how are you feeling today? What's your mood? Um, I know maybe this uh, it's an afternoon after lunch for everyone in the room. Um, so let us know how you feel before we enter enter our training to see um, if we're all ready to 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 dig into the contents of Jet C here. So I'll give you a few more seconds before I close this poll. All right. Okay. So we're receiving some answers and responses. Okay, I'm gonna close this poll. Three, two, one, okay. So, all right. So I see uh, most of you here are excited to uh, learn about Jetsy, how you integrate Jetsy into your work plan. Some people say, say here they're curious and they're fine. Yeah, big lunch. Good. We also had a big lunch here among our team as well. Okay, great. I think th those are most of the positive moods that everyone is feeling right now. So that's excellent. Now I'm going to open to the next poll. Tell us, where are you joining from today? So we'd like to also know um, where each and everyone is right now, just to get a little bit of a uh, demographic image of where you are. So I'm gonna open this up for maybe 10 more seconds and then I'll close the poll. So please let us know where you're entering or joining this session from. Okay. All right. So I'll close, put the poll in three, two, one. Okay. Let's see. So, oh, cool. So a lot of you are, are joining from Thailand. Uh huh. Oh, I see someone from Chiang Mai, even. That's good. And Vietnam from Shanghai. Oh, hello. And Yangon from Myanmar, Kathmandu, Nepal. Wow, all right. Okay, so we have a kind of a diverse group here in the audience. Okay, next. And our last question here. Let's get to see if... Oh, sorry, there's like a technical issue here. Just give me a second. Okay, and last question here. Let us know what are you most looking forward to learning about today in the training? So just give a short sentence or um, maybe one word mm -hmm. to let us know what are you most looking forward from the training today? So again, I'll keep this up for a few more seconds. Okay. All right. So I can see here a lot of you wanted to see Jetsy case studies, Jetsy tools, Jetsy concepts, um, practical advice. And more 
things about Jet C. Okay, great. So this is a good uh, uh, sign for the, our trainers, I believe, because uh, actually this a lot of the contents today will be about what uh, you are looking forward to today. So it's just thank you for everyone just to participate in doing this ice, short ice breaking session with, uh, with us. And so without further ado, I think we're ready to move on to our next session. And I'll stop sharing and hand over to Haisu, our MC here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brookie, and thanks for the little fun exercise. So before we move on to the training contents, uh, may we request all the participants to turn on the camera. If it's convenient for us to record a group photo, please. And smile. <laughs> So I will count to one, two, three. One, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, uh, now I'd like to introduce our trainers here. Buki, can you please share the slide? So today here we have our three dedicated trainers. First, we have Dr. Suswadi. She's a research fellow and also Samarnet Gender Advisory Group here at SCI. And second, we have Ms. Isabel. She works as research associate at the Gender Cluster at SCI, and she's also part of Samarnet Gender Advisory Group. And, and Mr. Suvanaran team, he is a fellow for my accounting tense program working specifically for Jetsi component. And so we are very excited to, to hear, to learn from their experience and insights. And first of all, I'd like to invite Dr. Siswali to start the training sections, please. Thank you very much, Kang Su. And Warm welcome to our participants all across um, the different areas that have been specified. And congratulations for making it into this course. We hope we will meet your expectations as you outlined when you registered and when you shared briefly in the introductions. So to get us started, um, I'll just do a recap of the training session objectives. We just have three, um, which is to understand the importance of JETSI in diverse disciplines. So my understanding of the participants is they are drawn from different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, given the time frame that we have for today, I will not promise you that we will cater in detail for all your disciplines, but I want to believe this is um, an introduction to quite a, an interesting field. And um, we will share a link later if you want to know more, especially in the field of gender and environment. SCI actually has an online course that you can undertake It's self paced Our other um, objective is to sharpen knowledge of JETSI concepts. So we've just been saying JETSI, in case someone is sitting on the other end and wondering, what are we talking about? This is gender equality, disability, and social inclusion. So um, just to highlight again that in different spaces, you'll come across different acronyms. I think the, the, the intention um, across the different acronyms remains the same. So in other instances, you'll find that the D is removed. So the disability tends to be missing. Um, but for purposes of today, we are tackling disability and social inclusion together. And then lastly, to just share examples of resources or tools that you can use in JETSI integration. 
I already saw there are people who are looking forward to have practical um, exercise, and we will have that in the last half of our training session. So at this point, I will ask Narong to play for us a short video, which we did under what we call our MTT Mekong Thought Leadership and Think Tanks program. Is it playing? Um, that's just to share with you what inclusion means to different people. Um, so as you saw, leaving no one behind, it means we need to bring people of diverse um, backgrounds, people of diverse identities, making sure that um, we are not excluding anyone within the work that we are doing. And um, making sure that we are able to incorporate the diverse voices, the diverse perspectives, um, and realizing that it's not just one dominant group that has um, authority over the other groups as well. So we are going to have a bit of interaction in this first part of our presentation. And it's simple, um, just using the chat function, um, Please just share with us briefly, why do you think Jetsi is important to your work? So when you look at the work that you're doing currently, why do you think Jetsi is important? Um, we'll just have one minute for people to quickly type in your response and um, we'll ask you to send. We can do this as a chatter for, so type in your response, hold it, and then I'll ask you to click send. Please type in your response, hold it, I'll ask you to send. Why is Jetsi important in the work that you do? I'm using the person sitting next to me as my gauge. So once they finish typing, I will know you're all ready. Okay, on the count of three, two, one, yes. Let's send our responses. Let's see what we have. Observing disparities, giving everyone equal chance. It's an inclusive approach to hear and address the voices of all and have a workplace balance. Ensure our program is inclusive and effective. Different people have different needs. That's a good one. Ensure all individuals are given equal opportunities. Thank you very much um, for those responses. We'll move on to our next um, our next slide. 
Um, so I just want to share this with you. I, I developed this diagram um, back in 2022 when I joined SCI. So what happened was I was assigned three projects that had been done and completed different in geographical space. One was from Africa, one was from here in Thailand, and the third one was from Latin America. And in terms of focus, they were also different. One was looking at urban transport. That was the project from Africa. Um, another one was looking at water resources management in Latin America. And then the one from Thailand was looking at environmental defenders, access of local communities to protected forest areas. And um, even with that diversity, there were common elements that you could pick from all the projects in terms of what were the issues, what was happening. And I want to believe it relates to some of the work that we do as well um, from our different disciplines. But what I want to highlight to you is some of the challenges or some of the issues that emerge um, in some of the development projects that we work in. Um, you can pick any arrow that you want to start with. I'll give you an example. Um, an equal power means there is people who are more powerful than others in society. And at times it may be the decision makers. So we end up seeing a lot of top-down decision making. And that top-down decision making means there'll be lack of community participation. Unfortunately, I don't have a pointer, um, but I would have shown you the arrow on the far left um, so we started at the top left corner with unequal power, and that um, links to top-down decision-making, which affects traditional livelihood strategies of communities. And then you can see that in turn, it affects people who are living on cash-based economies. And if you look at um, who are those people and what eventually happens, we see low household income, and you can see, um, again, linked to cash-based economies, you see that it leads to informality of all sorts in terms of settlements and connections. And if you follow that, you end up in the top right corner. We have issues such as knowledge and information gaps. And then all those are just a web of complex interconnections. And each of us may be tackling just one spot of that complex picture. And um, what's important is to understand the under, underpinning development issues in terms of development paradigms. We talk of neocolonialism, we talk of colonial legacies. These days, there's a lot of talk about decolonialism and things like that. And we also consider governance systems. I won't go into much detail about those. And um, we have the context. I think we've had a lot in terms of realities, in terms of experiences, norms and values, culture, etc. And then we also have to know that this is a cross scale. So what may seem like it's starting at household level actually transcends across scale, in some instances, ending up at um, global level. Now we move on to our next um, activity. Another one minute, um, take a look at that picture. It's not the best picture, but it's what I could immediately find close to me. And I want us to answer um, those three questions. Just again, via the chat function, please type in one group of people that you are seeing in the picture. Please type in one group of people that you're seeing in the picture. Just type and send. Um, what, which group of people can you identify in that picture? Do we have any responses coming? Yes, elderly people, young people. Um, let's keep them coming. Yes, people with disability, children, youth. Okay, I will close it at this point. Let's move on to the next question. Um, which group or which groups of people do you work with in your job or function and why? 
So reflect again in the work that you do. Who are you working with? Which group of people? Just type in and send. Youth and adult group, young, young, um, youth, women and children, young and adult, women informal waste collectors. Um, anyone else? Who are you working with? People with disabilities. Okay, I will close it here again. And the last question, just for your reflection, we're not going to answer this one. Which group or groups of people are missing in your work and why? Please think about that. Remember we said inclusion starts with I, it starts with me. We are leaving no one behind. So I will quickly just bring all that we have been talking about and just put it into context. Remember the first picture that I shared, um, that complex diagram, I said um, the issues are across scale. So from a global context, why, why do we talk about Jetsi? And um, we find that this is entrenched in the sustainable development goals. That's why we got a lot of responses that say inclusion means leaving no one behind, which is the SDG rallying call for 2030. And we see the interconnections of the SDGs as well. So we know that when we are talking gender equality or women's and girls empowerment and social inclusion, while we're addressing that through SDG 10, for instance, you'll find that there's other um, SDGs that were also uh, making progress on at the same time. So that's just one example of the global context and linking it to Jetsi. And then we bring it home within the Mekong region. I'll just share an example from one of the leading institutions within um, the Mekong region, which is um, a document that we got from the Mekong River Commission. And just to share the highlighted part, why, that, why are they engaged in JETSI? To support national agencies in the member countries to mainstream gender into development plans, the MRC has developed gender responsiveness plan, gender cube, ETC. So we see that even in some of the policies, in some of the policy making institutions, we have jet JETSI or gender um, covered. And then this is another example as well, which is talking about um, JETSI. This one is specific, it's, it's JETSI. The other one was talking about gender only. So you will see again, they highlight what um, their project or their documents will do and focus on. I will not get into those in detail. And just to wrap up, bringing it home and lending this in terms of why we talk about JETSI, um, in terms of a programmatic overview within Summonet and within the SYP. So um, the goal is to make sure that the work that you do is, um, Young, professional do, young professionals does no harm. It's diverse, inclusive, and you are able to address inequalities in the different spaces that you work in. And um, there is also an excerpt from the SYP brief. All of SYP's work recognizes the connection between the environment and the human of Mekong, the humans of Mekong. And the focus remains on engaging, networking, and strengthening the skills of young professionals. A just and sustainable Mekong future means we are working and including people of all identities, of all diversities. So we need to ensure that inclusiveness and gender responsive solutions are led by the SYP network. And on that note, I will end here in terms of the motivation. We started from different angles and we were able to land it home. What brings us together today? Thank you. And um, I'll hand over to Narong. Thank you so much, T. Um, and hello to everyone once again. So um, I'm going to let everyone know about um, the conceptual, like what is Jet C? Um, I think we will begin. I think we will begin our discussion with um, this picture, and I would like to ask for all of your participation. 
um, to either unmute yourself or maybe you also can drop a comment in the chat box um, just to answer what, what do you see in the future? What do you see in the features and what have happened in the features? Poor people, women and children, women and children working hard, women and a boy pitching for it. Yes, that is a good one. Women are pitching for it. Um, what is access issue, what are insecurities? Okay, so, so um, I'm going to ask, do you know why um, women and boys um, are going to change the waters? It is because of her role? It is because of um, their need? Or is it because of um, like there's something that they really have to do? What is the reason why um, they are uh, fishing the waters? Yes, gender-based role. Can you, can you just comment in the chat box or maybe you can unmute yourself and answer to the question? Maybe maybe repeat your question again. Um, yes, I'm asking, uh, and the comments say, um, the women and child and a child, they are fetching the waters. And I'm asking, why do they have to fetch the waters? Is it because of their role? or it is because um, they need the water. Yes, no adequate access to water because there's no water. So like the women and, and child, like they have to go and fishing the water because of the need for water, which is not easy access for them. Yes. Uh, mostly it happens since go and women work. Yes. Okay. Um I think we will I will I will stop it here and then I will just go with the definition of gender equality. I think um like as you can see in the picture, there's women and a child that they are going to fetching the waters as for their need. And um it is like it is part of their, their role. It is like the socially constructed. And in the comment, you also can see that, like, where's the men? Um, why there's no men in the picture? Because, like, there is the society expectation that women and children or girls, they need to go and doing um, the chore work or doing the housework. And this is, like, really the expectation that have been placing on women and girls and children to do this work. And when it comes to the concept of gender equality, we are more focused on the equal rights, responsibility, and opportunity for uh, women, men, and non-binary group. And often, um, when I think like uh, people here, they are most likely they are like a just a practitioner or gender practitioner. And when you come to the field work, and then you might hear like uh, people say when you are talking about gender equality, and then people say, oh. Um, gender equality is all about raising uh, women's rights. Um, I think uh, we are not raising women's rights when it comes to gender equality. We are um, ensuring the equal rights between men, women, and non-binary groups so that they, so that their um, aspiration and the need of men and women um, are well used, are equally well used, and accountable for it. Um, so this is the concept of gender equality, where we aim to make sure that um, both men, women, and non-binary group are uh, equally access to rights, responsibility, and opportunity. And I will go to the concept of social inclusion. I think um, during the first part, they have mentioned a lot about like sustainable development goal. And when it comes to social inclusion, I think the concept of social inclusion is really linked to um, the global development that we have to include everyone in our um, decision making, like our uh, implementation process. 
So when it comes to like social inclusion, it defined as the term of improving the process um, um, in terms of ability, opportunity, and resources, especially for um, the disadvantaged um, group, in order for them to fully participate or in order for them to meaningfully participate in the um, development process, policy making, or uh, program implementation. And I think uh, before I go further to the next um, concept, I would like to ask um, like everyone here, uh, what do you think that the teacher represent, oh my goodness, represent disability, all disability that we know, yes or no? Do you think that all, like the picture here represent all disability type that we know or like we miss some disability? No, no, not complete yet, okay. No mental, okay, that's good. Um, okay, no represent uh, mental disability, um, yes. Okay, um, oh, oh my God. Um, yes, um, I think you are right. Um, some disability look like this. Um, a kind of like visible disability that you actually can uh, visualize, uh, but some disability look like this. Um, that it is like the invisible disability that related to your uh, mental related. It could be a depression, anxiety, yes. Um, that related to your mental health. So when it comes to uh, disability inclusion, uh, when it comes to JETC, disability inclusion is also one of the components that we are talking about. It emphasize on um, the function, on the way uh, people function and how they participate in the society and uh, making sure that everybody has the same opportunity. So this is really important that to make to make sure that um, the people with disability, they are able to participate in, in your um, program design implementation or um, policy making, just to make sure that we have the, um, like we, we remain the social inclusion concept that we have talked earlier. And the big question here, like everyone, my question, like why it only emphasize on people with disability and how about the other uh, socially marginalized group? For example, um, for example, uh, people with little education, um, are they not included? Um, why it only emphasize on disability inclusion? I think the concept of disability inclusion here is more emphasize on the inclusive design uh, which is simply mean that if we meet the high test need of one individual or a group of people, which simply mean that everyone can benefit from that creative adaptation. So we try to engage everyone, but when it comes to disability inclusion, it's it more on emphasize on inclusive design just to make sure that they are accessible, they are comfortable to participate in our intervention. And here is the intersectionality. So the concept of intersectionality is more emphasize on, on power relation and privilege that, that once people have unique experience, either privilege or discrimination, it based on their ability, on their nationality, their age, their culture, their education, their trust. For example, um, there are two people, generally speaking, there are two people. There is a woman from uh, remote areas and um, she, she is discriminated from a labor market, uh, maybe because like the employer perceived that um, she is a woman. Um, so like this is one discrimination based on her genders. 
um, maybe um, she is discriminated from a labor market just because she is young and the employer might perceive that um, she will be, she is going to have like a child, like she is going to have pregnant, which is not for, which is not good for the company, for example. Um, she's come from the remote area, um, which the employer might perceive that um, she might have a little education and um, the company might have to spend a lot of time in order to train her. So this is like the intersectional uh, discrimination that um, she's experienced. This is not one, but it kind of like overlapping based on the background where she's from. But imagine if, if that person is a man. She has come from the same location. He has also come from the same location, from the remote area with the same education, with the same background. But he kind of like, he tends to have like less leisure intersectional discrimination than women. For example, because of his gender, he is men. So like he is more privileged than women that um, the, the labor market or the employer tend to choose him instead of a woman. Yes. And this is all about the intersectionality as emphasize on the power relation, power dynamic and, and privilege and discrimination that one people experience to that. Okay, so I'm not talking about the do no harm principle. I think um, the word do no harm or they speak a definition. Uh, um, I'm going to give you an example after you actually understand about the intersectionality. For example, for uh, the women's status, um, that uh, she might likely experience a lot of discrimination rather than men. Um, imagine if you are working in in um, the worst sector, water, sanitation, and hygiene sector. And generally speaking, um, worst sector is uh, seem to be a technical sector and it most likely a male dominant sector. So if you think that you want to empower uh, women who are working in the worst sector to become a worst sector leader, um, do you think that you, ex I think it might expose her into like the discrimination against her from her male colleague, from, from her supervisor and the work sectors. Um, it also um, put thing, a lot of pressure for her um, during her time at work, um, within her colleagues some things like that. So the do no harm principle is, to really think about the discrimination, the the um the privilege and power relation that one person experienced to that, or your uh, target audience experienced to that, and to have to making sure that all of your intervention and implementation make sure that it is no harmful, and it makes sure that it is inclusive, empowering, and transformative, and. If we can look at the uh, gender war system outcome framework uh, from what it is, um, they have like the, uh, when it comes to do no harm, they kind of like have the indicator to access um, their program implementation, uh, either, for example, at the individual level, if their program implementation or their program design is harmful or not, is it inclusive enough? Is it in a level of empowering or transformative? So I think I will stop here and I will give um give um the floor to my colleague Isabel to present you about the technical. Yep. Perfect. Thanks so much, Narong, and thanks for everyone um, for joining. Um, so as the um, questionnaire that you did at the beginning, it was great to see all the different responses of why you joined this training and what you want to get out of it, as well as the challenges that you currently face integrating GEDSI into your work. 
So I think this is a perfect entry point into this part of the training, which is the technical part, the resources and the tools uh, for integrating JEDSI into your work. So we already heard a little bit about the how and the what from Dr. C and Narong, and we will also take the next 20 minutes to consider the how and how to integrate JEDSI. So hopefully we can approach this in a way that people can um, take some information um, away after this training. So we've broken it down into these six JEDC principles. So hopefully it's not too overwhelming for you. Um, so as you can see, it's okay. Um, yeah, as you can see on the um, slides, these are the six principles that we wanted to share. And as I mentioned, your response is highlighted that you want to learn the practical tips to understand JEDC better, or you also might just have a curiosity of how to apply it into your work. So these six principles aim to cover these challenges and points that you have mentioned that you would like to improve. Um, just to mention that these six principles were co um, developed by SEI colleagues um, in this center. Um, so the plan is just to go through each principle um, to help you understand a little bit better. Um, so as Narong has nicely explained, the intersectional gender lens, we are now at least a little bit familiar with this and know that gender is critically important um, for research. But the notion of JEDSI as a whole, it highlights that just one concept is not a standalone element. So we also have lots of different social dimensions too. So this means that gender interacts with so many other elements such as age, education levels, ethnicity, class, and this list just goes on. But by using this intersectional lens in our research, it means that we are um, looking at these elements together. So maybe some elements offset elements um, of discrimination or others will be compounding um, these forms of marginalization. And this specific diagram on the right of the slide uh, discusses intersectionality in a Canadian context with the elements closer to the um, middle of the circle showing those with increased power in their social context. For example, Suppose that you're a straight white cis man who speaks English or French with a high education level. Um, and in this case, you are more likely to have more power than, for example, a rural disabled indigenous woman with no formal education. <laughs> um, so the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the next slide provides some questions um, that we can use to investigate um, investigate uh, the intersectional lens. Um, for example, in this context and scale, how do gender together with other aspects of social identity interact to produce advantages and disadvantages? And what are the most significant areas of marginalization or power? So the main questions we need to look at, who are the most vulnerable, who has the power and why? What's, what are the reasons behind this? Um, yeah, section two. So the second principle um, looks at when is the right time to integrate a JEDC lens into a project cycle? And the answer is actually at all phases. So when we want, what we want to avoid is gender or JEDC evaporation. And this means that JEDC is often addressed at the beginning of the project cycle or mentioned at the proposal stage, but then it's almost forgotten about or sometimes mentioned um, um, the opposite. So it's never mentioned in the project and then it pops up at the last minute, um, almost as an afterthought. So what we need to remember um, for a strong project that incorporates JEDC is that we must do our best to apply this um, throughout the whole project. And there are specific points at each stage that you can stop and consider for your team. For example, looking at your team composition and ensuring that you have a diverse team, making sure that social and gender expertise are throughout and not just isolated in one small component. So for the purpose of time, I won't go through all of these, but they are, um, this is very important to consider 
And it's a useful flow diagram um, to remind you to stop and reflect at each stage of the research process. Okay, um, principle three is what we call the gender continuum. Um, and what this shows is that when we design a project, we can start to break down what is our fundamental approach when we're considering GEDSI. And this links very well to Narong's do no harm approach um, when we consider GEDSI. So what we want to avoid here is this gender blind. And this is the top left box. That means that teams go into situations often without considering gender and they just don't see or even acknowledge the gender or social inequities. So they don't see um, the differences um, between different social groups. Um, and they often, um, they often justify this by saying that it's, oh, it's gender neutral, but we need to remember that there's no such thing as being gender neutral um, in, re in research because these injustices and unequal power relations are always there. Even if we don't think so from the outside, um, so when we don't consider these, we will simply be reinforcing or making worse these imbalances, especially when we neglect to include this GEDC analysis. Um, so moving on to the gender aware section, um, this is where we are moving towards where we want to be. And this is understanding that there are in inequalities and indifferences. Um, so, so the far left, um, is where we want to avoid again, which is exploitative. For example, when we look at a project uh, with wash girls, for example, and the project is considering and targeting women, but they are exploiting the underlying gender norms, such as exploiting the association of women through cooking or washing. This is still kind of acknowledging gender imbalances, but it's exploiting them for the wrong reasons, which ultimately worsens these inequalities. And then the middle section, so accommodating um, and transformative. So I guess the best way to describe accommodating and transformative and what's the difference is accommodating, for example, is a project that understands women and men play important roles, for example, in forestry communities. So inviting them to capacity development workshops and community decision-making meetings and making sure that these meetings are held at the times that work for women and men and provide inputs for women so that they can overcome these existing barriers. But if we're just accommodating, this often results in men going away, using this information and implementing it. But it often means that women who have this new information, but they aren't able to apply it. And this is often because of the underlying gender norms. That means that communities sometimes don't trust women as leaders to manage these resources. And so the information does not empower or transform these gender norms. So the transformative alternative would be to engage men and women, not only in technical training, for example, but also in conversations at the household and community level, um, discussing those norms and barriers. And in doing so, you'll be able to then shift the beliefs and norms. So it is talking about addressing those underlying barriers and norms um, that affect the whole community. Okay, uh, and we've got number four. Um, principle number four um, is talking about, ah, so we've got a GEDC lens. So that must mean that you're doing some form of analysis. But if you haven't already done this, it's very clear, um, well, it isn't very clear on what you're supposed to be looking at. So this is a very simple framework shown here of the four things that every research program can, ad can adapt to overcome some of these GEDC issues. So we have access to resources and benefits, decision-making and control. So who makes these decisions um, at different levels? the formal and informal structures. So these could be about um, the higher policies or more um, informal structures in communities. And then finally, the gender division of labor. And this is talking about who 
um, who does what kind of thing. Um, and I remember an example of a project that one of my colleagues actually told me about um, in relation to this that helped me to understand and explain more broadly um, why GEDC lens is super critical when doing research. And the project was a bioeconomy or nature-based solution project. Um, and this related to um, an innovation process that involved looking at changing the fish feeds um, from expensive and imported and unsustainable fish feed, which aimed to move to more local vegetable um, scraps. Um, and this from the outside seemed like a brilliant idea. But as the process went on, they discovered that actually it worsened these gender inequalities in the community and specifically between men and women because they did not do this type of gender analysis um, and they didn't look at the bottom left one, gender division of labor. So whilst these vegetable scraps were not used by men who had paid businesses around fishing or cattle, the scraps were already being used by women who used them for their chickens, for feed for their chickens. And as the chickens were the only source of income for women and also provided um, really important nutrition for their households, it meant that switching to the scraps for feed, they were then denying access um, for women um, because the decision-making in the households are often dominated by the men. So this means, um, this links again with the gender norms um, that often um, place men as the breadwinner, breadwinners and women as caregivers. Um, yeah, so this example is a great reminder that it's easy to forget that research does not only lead to good things, but it can have risks. And this is why we need to consider this. And then again, we've got the, um, to remember that there are differentiated needs and preferences. And this links particularly with human-centered design and needing to analyze the gendered needs and preferences before implementing um, your, your innovative processes. Um, and the next slide. So this next slide um, highlights that we should also consider these questions at scale. So we must ask these questions at different levels from individual to household and larger scales, um, which then um, has more local scale impacts as well. So looking at it from different scales. Okay. Um, and number five, principle number five, um, when we talk about outcomes for women, for example, um, but this could be for any social group, the, this principle asks us to distinguish along the top line here. So this is between reach, benefit, and empowerment. So reach means at a minimum, an outcome reaches people involved in the research process or the development activity that we're talking about. And this is very important because it's not the same as benefit. Benefit is where people actually have opportunities to use these resources. Maybe they're gaining information or maybe they're accessing a certain crop or land or water, but that doesn't um, flow from reach automatically. And so when we develop research, we can't assume that simply having people involved that they will then benefit. Um, and then it's the same jump from benefit to empowerment. So it's often that empowerment is written in proposals, but then it's often misinterpreted in the sense that it was assumed that if you have people benefiting, such as having access to um, land or um, crops, then they would then be empowered. Or for instance, women going to these training workshops or capacity development on a new type of technology, and then assuming that they would then be empowered. But in fact, it just means that they had better access or better information. But empowerment is um, fundamentally different. And it means actually having a strengthened voice or a choice to choose and have freedom and ability to make and act on these decisions. So these three, the reach, benefit and empowerment are very useful when we talk about individuals. But when we talk about making societal changes and shifting patterns and changing these pathways, um, we're talking about changing the root causes of inequality, poverty and gender inequality in a society. And this is different um, when talking about transformative outcomes. 
Um, so this rebat is very useful um, when we're considering um, designing our research um, and the research proposals, for example. And then finally, um, ne um, number six is all about reflexivity. And it's saying that we as researchers are not working outside of the research process, we're actually working within it. And at the heart of this is considering that research is taking place in an unequal landscape. So if we're not aware of this, um, as well as the power that researchers hold, we can accidentally contribute to worsening inequalities. Um, and this could be between um, different social groups or different genders. So this reflexivity is recognizing the risks, but also recognizing that we have the potential uh, through understanding um, and taking the time as not just individuals, but as our research teams to reflect on our position of power within the research that we're doing. Okay, so these are the, they're the six principles um, that can help you guide and integrate JEDC throughout your research and points it to help you consider. Um, so I know another reason for your attendance of this training was to learn more about and hear some example tools used in your research. So I'll use the next couple of minutes to, um, to show you some example tools. Um, so while there are many tools that have been developed to measure social and gender empowerment, I've just selected these two for today. So the first tool is called Empowerment in WASH Index, which was actually designed by SEI colleagues to measure empowerment in the WASH sector. And a key objective was aiming to measure and assess empowerment in relation to the roles and responsibilities and also address empowerment at the individual, household and community levels. So this is a survey based tool. And this tool is fairly unique as it aims to address not just the individual and household levels, but assesses the broader community level as well. And then the other one is the Women Empowerment and Agriculture Index. Um, and this tool um, directly measures the empowerment of men and women in the agricultural sector. Um, and both tools can be tailored to specific co social and cultural contexts and can fill these gender and social um, data gaps as well. And they both use the survey method, which allows researchers to make assessments and capture both the positive or negative gender outcomes of these interventions, um, which can then ultimately uh, increase empowerment. Um, so whilst I don't have a lot of time now to go into much more detail about these tools, um, I've provided the links here for you to do some further reading into the, these two specific tools. And then finally, I just wanted to share some resources. So here on the slide, I'm just sharing a very colorful mind map of all the um, resources curated by SEI researchers. And they are organized into different themes for ease um, and accessibility. So they've all got a link um, to the resources as well. And you can find the resource that contains the six principles that I just um, discussed in the yellow one, the integrating into research branch, um, which is something that I do find really interesting when considering JADC. Um, but yeah, it, we should also know that um, these are just SCI resources and there are many other resources um, from other organizations, which we will share a list, list of after the training. Um, but that's all I have time for now. So I'll pass you back um, for the question and answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for all our three uh, trainers for sharing such broad knowledge and insights on the topic. And I think it's got a lot of information to digest, but if our participants has some questions, this is the time we have a couple of minutes dedicated for Q&A, you can either drop in the Q&A chat box or you can also raise your hand and you can ask directly to our trainers. Welcome. If I can come in, just to share an, an experience from um, one of the projects that I work in. 
Islands. We, we were doing a similar training, but tailored for an agroecology and food systems project within the Mekong region. And we started off well. It's a project that has a lot of physical or technical scientists. So when we start, you know, people are a bit uncomfortable that you are asking them to start talking about gender, when they are animal scientists, when they are soil scientists, how does that link up to the work that they do? And um, we go through the process. Um, and then we go through, if you remember principle number four, is it? Reach, benefit, empowerment, and transformation. And usually things start unfolding from principle one. Um, and then as you go through the principles, so by the time we get to principle four, people are already reflecting in terms of their work. And then they shared with us that, um, you know, usually when they do their agroecology trainings with the farmers, yeah, we, 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 we do well when it comes to this gender thing, you know, because usually more than 50% of our participants are women which is good even for anyone who's doing their mail, it will seem like, okay, you're doing well. And then we go on, okay, so you have more than 50% of your participants as women, yes. And then their reflection was, but the women are not adopting the technologies that we have trained them on. So yes, they show up for the trainings, but they are not adopting what you have trained them on. And remember, we Isabel shared the four di dimensions, the quadrants. And then as we continue asking, because Jetsy is about asking why, especially the why is behind the quantitative figures that you get. So it turns out, yeah, of course, the women come for the training. Um, but in their households, they do not have the decision making power to say, yes, let's adopt this technology. So in terms of reach, you are reaching them, but are they benefiting from your project? Are they benefiting from your interventions? So what do you need to do for them to benefit? You need to empower them so that they can make strategic life decisions, such as adopting to make, um, such as deciding to make, to adopt a technology. So that is how, simply put, you know, you can look at rich benefit empowerment. And then that will require that in some instances, you have to engage in transformation so that you change. Why is it that women cannot make um, strategic life decisions? What is it? Is it the patriarchal systems that they are in? Is it the culture? Is it the norms? Is it the policies, for instance? Um, so you start asking the whys till you get the answers. I will pause here because I see someone wants to share their experience as well. Please, someone wants to share. So I see Bowie Pat hands up. If you have questions, please feel free to unmute and speak. Um, thank, thank you, Kang Su, and thank you to the um, three presenters for um, sharing your um, knowledge with us today. Um, I, I'm, I'm Boren Pat, I'm uh, based at Chiang Mai University, um, and I may be coming from a more of a project coordinator kind of background, so my, question, my two questions will kind of um, be from that perspective as well. The first one I uh, is about, the first question is um, a follow-up to um, uh, I think Isabel mentioned about jet sea evaporation, which I thought was a it's an interesting term that I probably encountered quite a bit um, in working in different projects and stuff. And just wondering, I guess, um, what, so what if you start with a jet sea from the beginning of the project, but as you mentioned, it slowly evaporates? Is there kind of a way to still recover from that, or is there, or is there like a point of no return? I guess is my question. I'm just trying to imagine, like for example, if I'm or another project is in the middle or towards the end of the project and they're really realizing, just realizing that they're not hitting their jetty targets. What, what is there to do? I mean, I, I assume that they shouldn't just give up because because I don't I don't think they should give up, but but I'm just wondering, yeah, what, what is like, what can be recovered, I guess, in, in that kind of situation? 
Um, my second question uh, is more of a my, my own curiosity, I guess. Um, and it relates to the presentation, uh, the slide about the gender approach. Um, because in in, in projects, uh, I see a lot of um, how do I say uh, the, the gender blind kind of language. And and to me, I'm just wondering about this phrasing, the gender blind, from a Jetsi expert perspective. Is this kind of phrasing problematic? Because we're kind of using the word blind in a kind of negative connotation and and especially given the context of Jetsi, I'm just wondering if there's a better way to communicate that, or do we see that this kind of phrasing will, will change or should be changed? Again, this second question is more my own curiosity. I'm, I'm curious to know what, what um, all of you think. So thank you. Okay, um, thanks for your questions, Boripat. And I will respond ahead of Isabel. So I'll start with your last observation, gender blind versus, I think you're, you're putting it versus um, proper disability language. Did I get you right? How yeah. can we use blind um, when we're also talking about disability? Correct, but, yes. Um, another way of looking at it, I think even within the disability movement, there has been calls to shift from things such as um, someone is deaf to referring to someone as hearing impaired or hearing impairment. Same thing with um, blind. I think there's been calls to refer to people with blindness as visually impaired. I think um, that's also trying to shift away from those. And when we maintain that term within the gender space, I'm not saying it's wholly um, the best approach, but at times it helps us make people realize the gravity of the situation. Just like within the disability space, people don't want to refer to blindness. Um, hopefully when we make people realize what you're doing is actually blind and we are shifting away from blindness, it will call people to action. So that's my just my reflection on this um, and quite an interesting um, contribution that you bring for Repat and food for thought for all of us, definitely. And then on the second one, in terms of how do you take corrective measures when um, there's been Chetsi evaporation? I think the one thing that happens during projects is you have um, your male framework, for instance, which sets out what is it that you want to achieve and what you want to do and um, how you are going to measure and all that. So as you are doing your mail and collecting your data and realizing that we are missing the mark on certain elements, it then requires that you as a project team are adaptive. And um, how adaptive can you be given that, especially research projects, they are time limited, they are budget limited. I think that's why we have to place emphasis on um, the second principle that integrate right from the start and throughout the project. And it starts from building a good team that will carry um, the requirements of the project throughout and you'll take each other to account. Um, so yeah, those are the two things that I could think about. There could be many alternatives that we can explore in our group work as well, and we see how we can apply. So thank you very much, Boripat. I think you've set a good foundation for our next session of group work. That's why you're a research coordinator. Thank you. And thank you. I also see a couple of questions in the chat box, but in the interest of time, we cannot take it all. So for our next activity is to have a group section where we have a focus group for three different groups with these our three trainers. So the topic one is integrating Jetsi in methods and data collection. The topic two is Jetsi integration in designing new research projects. And the last one will be disability inclusion in program implementation. So don't worry, we will also drop the this um, division in the chat box so that you, you can uh, see more details. Um, um, now, I'm sorry, Kangshu. 
I'm, I'm sorry to cut you, um, but I find Marina's question is really interesting. And it's something that is really relevant to, um, if you don't mind, I may ask for one minute to share my experience. I think what Marina has mentioned in the comment section is really common in Cambodia. And I, I have no doubt why women uh, perceive themselves um, they are not good enough. They are not. They are not capable enough to make the decision. Um, according to gender power analysis conducted by World Aid in 2020 um, and the Cambodia War Sector, uh, they found out that um, women find themselves um, they are not suitable to work in the technical sector in the war sector, and and that is really a challenging um, for us as who are working in the war sector and trying to empower women um, to participate in the war sector, not just at the household level, but also at the sector levels. Um, I think um, this is really related to um, the intersectionality because um, like, because, and it also related to gender equality because like, um, like women have been told from one generation to another generation that, um, they are not go good enough to do um, the kind of stuff like women only supposed to stay at home and listen to their to their husband something like that like they have been told they have been touched like this from from their parent from their ancestor from uh, from one generation to another generation so it is really hard to change their perspective but one of the but uh, I just want to share some of the intervention that uh, I have involved in my previous organization, which is related to behavioral change communication, BCC, uh, which is we try to promote gender equality, but also engagement into uh, the discussion and the dialogue. Uh, like, like we are trying to explain men what, what is a good role model to be like a husband, to create a nobling environment into the household. We also have um, like, um, like the family champion model, which is um, related to gender equality. And we also engage world sector leaders to, to emphasize more about um, gender role and, and, the, and the technical sector. So I think this is some of the example intervention that related to that. So thank you so much. Yep. Uh, thank you for taking the time to answer these questions. Uh, so like I was mentioning earlier, now it's a time to break out the groups. And in the chat, I have sent some screenshots about uh, group work detail, but our trainers will also be with each group to explain further if you have any questions and do guide through the exercise. So now, um, Buenam has uh, separated the rooms.
with it. Okay. So actually, on the on the task that we are going to do the investigation access to the uh this this part the mute. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hello. Okay. So, so the topic is mainly regarding to the investigation access to the disparity among different demographic groups. So, the, the uh, regarding to the land, uh, natural resource, and our group, uh, we choose the topic uh, on the. Where is it going? It's not group one. Okay, fine. Yes. So our topic is mainly on gender equality and land rights, focusing on the women access right to land ownership. Uh, actually, we haven't finished everything yet, but the conclusion to answer the two questions, one is how design method and in our research project, and second is what are the key aspects that uh, that we pay attention to the research. So, so, so the team decide to uh, use the uh, make method research, which is focused on the qualitative data and quantitative data. So, on the qualitative side, we as a team decide to focus on we focus on the review or the law. Um, they review data from a raw material from the NGO, etc. And for the quantitative data, the team agreed to uh, focus on one is the focus group discussion, which we mainly break out into a small, small group, which uh, focus on the uh, booming group. Uh, indigenous women group and in um, LGBT uh, group etc. They get into that and for the uh, KII, what they call the key inform interview. We also uh, think about trying to interview the NGO uh, uh, perspective and also the government perspective, uh, government uh, side also and. In terms of the method as well, the team, one of the team uh, suggests to use the photo boy on the on the research method. So I don't, I don't know what it's specifically. So I I hope one of the team that posts about the photo boy can can explain on on that. So I think so this is also what we have been done so far from the group one. I think our member could also say in terms of photo boy as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Team One, for sharing. Now we are a little bit running out of time, so I'd like to invite next the the second group to share with us what's your discussion like. So for. Am I? Okay. So hi everyone, I'm Medina. Um, so for the second um, topic, which is on GC integration and projects proposals, uh, we have a lot of um, thoughts and also a lot of notes and it's like flying around. <laughs> um, first, uh, we kind of like look into principle one, which is into into the uh, intersectional lens. And we wanna make sure that Jesse is considered throughout every uh, process or every phases. So it should be considered in the beginning and then it make sure we may have to make sure that it doesn't evaporate in the middle or the last stage. And um, 
the second principle, which is to avoid jet sea bubble. Okay, we I talked about it already. And then uh, in the team com composition, we kind of like, we want to make it balanced and make sure that the gender are balanced in the team. And we make sure that we familiarize team members with relevant international and regional frameworks or guidelines that is related to jet sea. Or we can use the six principles of jet sea to apply to our uh, proposal. And the team composition, we have to ensure that the team members should include like various genders, disabilities, and social uh, background. And um, during the data collection, we make sure that we identify the key stakeholders, which is which should be include um, marginalized and underrepresented groups, which is like women, young, and older adults. Dis disabled people and the minorities, and we should consider how factors such as gender disability and those jet Z people to intersect and then shape the experience and outcome. Mm -hmm. And we uh, apply the intersectionality approach to, to recognize and address multiple and um, intersect intersecting identities and experience of individual within the research um, context. And then I'm not gonna go over uh, into all of that because there's a lot. And then we should consider include, uh, including the indicators and to ensure that uh, JETC integration is in the M&E MN plan, and then we monitor and evaluate the framework that is includes the indicator of the JETC. And when we communicate, when once we are done done uh, the research, we communicate and make sure that the community knows about our research. And these uh, should the language should be in uh, in terms of like everyone should understand uh, our uh, research. Uh, result. I think that's all. I think I hope I cover everything. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Group Two. And now, may I invite the representative of Group Three <laughs> to share with us? Yep. Hi, Kang So um, I'm representing Group Three. Um, uh, the group discussion where um, our main question was um, uh, how to ensure that people with disabilities are uh, included in the design and delivery of our activities. And from our group discussions, I think we identified that there are some challenges that related to integrating PWDs in various research issues, um, including environmental um, research as well. Um, there are some issues um, that we have to take into account when doing research in that includes people with disability, including um, stigma related to disabilities, as well as um, what Narong had presented earlier about how it's not always easy or um, straightforward on, to identify a person with disabilities. Um, I think what we can do in terms of as researchers, I think maybe the first um, thing is to familiarize ourselves with the vocabulary concepts and definitions around PWD. Um, for example, not using, I'm not calling people disabled or something like that, but using people um, using PWD or for another example is like not saying I'm mentally disabled, but using the, I think that the, the term um, neurodivergent or something like that. So just becoming a bit more aware about the terms and concepts that we ourselves as researchers use. Um, and in terms of actually designing the, our, our activities or research, um, we have to make sure that um, our objectives or our research questions link to the actual concerns of the PWDs. And this might involve um, doing like initial scoping kind of uh, survey or work, or maybe even connecting uh, with PWD focused organizations because they are the the best people the best um uh, best people to know how how and what the issues are and how we can best go around to engaging um, PWDs. I think that in terms of um, activities, there's maybe two different kinds of activities that we identified in our discussions. The first one is uh, like the more like event based or like workshop kind of activities where we want to engage PWDs and. For, for events, I think uh, from discussions, um, we have to provide, um, of course, facilities and support where as it, as it is needed. For example, at workshops, we may need to provide sign language interpreters, or we may need to offer some, um, uh, some facilities that help uh, to support people who are not very mobile. Um, and so, so I think 
uh, one of the um, observations was that maybe for events, because we can prepare in, in advance and we know who the POWD kind types might be attending, it's, it might be quite, it might be a bit more straightforward in terms of what kind of things we have to prepare beforehand. Another kind of activity that was a bit more, maybe a bit more challenging um, for researchers is when we do data collection, such as uh, large scale surveys or in-depth interviews, where when we go into the field, um, we may not be as well prepared as we could be in terms of um, uh, surveying or interviewing people with disabilities. Um, and so I think for, for surveys, um, I think it maybe starts from the question from the beginning with the, um, forming our questions um, you, and linking back to um, the vocabulary and concepts that we use, making sure that our questions reflect that, um, uh, uh, reflect and are uh, uh, using the correct kind of um, words. And also um, as best as we can to offer support and facilities um, to people with disabilities so that we can engage them in data collection as well, whether that be um, large scale surveys or in-depth interviews. And I think um, a key takeaway from the discussion is that to engage with people with disabilities, we have to plan ahead. I think that's the, the really important um, point. Um, we cannot, as our, one of the participants said, we cannot just um, uh, say that, okay, we're gonna go interview you tomorrow. It, it can, we cannot do like that because different people with different disabilities may require different kind of, um, uh, they, they have different kind of requirements. So we have to make sure that um, when we engage with them, we we want to build trust with them from the beginning. And by to build trust, we have to take their um, re requests and um, considerations into account so that we can build the meaningful engagement that we want. Um, thank you, Kang Su. Thank you so much for report and group three and all the groups who have just shared with us what they have discussed. Um, may I now quickly get back to Dr. Siswili to give us kind of what are the critical learning points for today's training, please. Um, thanks, Kang Su, and thanks to everyone in the groups. Um, I'm hoping that the, se the group sessions were the time wasn't enough, but I want to believe it was a good opportunity to set the ground for us to get started. At least now I'm hoping that um, people in this training have an idea. What does it mean when we say we want to integrate Jesse? Um, just for the from the group presentations, I want to highlight um, two things. And it's also a trend that I've picked in a few of the projects that I've had the opportunity to work with and review. So um, we spoke a lot in terms of data collection, but I think for group one and two, the presentations were silent in terms of the actual data analysis. And usually what you will see is, yes, people will go out and collect data and say, we will interview men and women. They come back, the data is analyzed, and in some instances, it's still analyzed within that binary, men and women, and it ends there. And then when it comes to writing the research outputs, whether it's a policy brief or it's a manuscript or it's a perspective piece, um, you'll find that at times we still go back and universalize. We say the farmers or the residents of such a place, we are not talking about who exactly is affected. If it was floods, who exactly was affected by floods? And then in some instances, you will get that men or women, young girls are affected. But at times we need to remember we say we are talking about intersectionality which makes us understand that men and women are not heterogeneous, are not homogeneous. There's diversity within those groups. So if you are going to say women, go deeper and say, which women are you talking about? Is it women who are unmarried? Because at times they have different opportunities or experiences from women who are married. Is it women who are of um, ethnic minorities, for instance? So I just want to encourage us that um, beyond this training, it's not an easy thing. It doesn't happen overnight, but I think the change that we hope to see, the transformation that we hope to see begins with us here. So let's um, put in that effort. It's easy to just put in you know, um, your analysis and say men and women, but at times we are denying ourselves and everyone else interested in our research of the real and the true reflections from the data that we collected. 
So I just wanted to emphasize that in data collection and in communication, um, that is where you see a lot of the jetsy evaporation. We started off well, our methodologies were good, but uh, on analysis, we started seeing it get lost. It happens when we're writing the outputs. It happens when we're doing the events. By the time you get to the events, at times there is not even a trace. You have to fight that. But guys, what happened to Jetsy at this point? If you start tracing, you have to go and do a lot of digging for you to bring it up. By that time, within teams, you are at each other's throats and it's not a nice thing. So yeah, um, I encourage us to really go deeper. Thank you very much. And um, on behalf of my colleagues, thank you for inviting us and we hope it's been um, a fruitful afternoon for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sisbele, for our accepting us to, to for our training. And now, very quickly, can I invite Ms. Tan at the SummerNet Steering Committee and also here at SYB Advisor to say a few words. Thank you on behalf of us. Um, if you could do it in one minute, that would be great. Thank you very much, Kaisu. Um, so I think the topic today is very interesting and relevant to all of uh, the researcher and can be applied with different background researcher. So that is the first benefit. And the second one is we also know that uh, we know how to include a different group of uh, more vulnerable group. Uh, so in the past, we normally just think about uh, vulnerable like women or farmer or the poor, but now we really take more consideration for 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 more uh, for more group of uh, um, inclusion such as uh, disabled uh, people with disability and uh, uh, it's new it's new takeaway and uh, some principle. We learned that it's quite a very relevant um, to, to the rather approach, such as empowerment, uh, such as the participation uh, approach and do no harm. So that is uh, really important for the young researcher to consider the principle, not only in the period, of, but really take consideration of the principles in the beginning of the research design as well as the, uh, the final step of the monitoring and evaluation. I think that is the new uh, significant, the significant of the topic of the, we see some challenges also for, for practical, for the young researcher who really did the uh, research in the field or in the future, they see that Challenges so find the find the possibility or find the solution to 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 narrow the gap for in the research and to make them more benefit and in the longer term and also for we we also see the importance of uh, communication between. Um, vulnerable group also with research like a uh, private sector. Uh, I think that is discussed today. The time. But um, uh, from from we learn that sorry more about the different group stakeholder communication and to make sure that not, not only single group uh, voice are heard, but even with visible, um, not visible, but people with disability or a uh, woman or man of um, young people have the, a position in the research. So that is very important takeaway for today. Thank you very much.
And also, I hope that the tool can be developed more in detail in the future. So for the young researcher, they can apply it uh, um, very, very specifically and in a structured way to apply the, the Jesse tool in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And so sorry to go over time, but I hope it's a really useful learning experience for all of, all of us here. Um, so as you, before we officially close, may I request to fill out the post event survey? This will really help us, like how much impact, how much you learn and to also um, tailor for our next training session. So thanks each and everyone, our esteemed speakers, trainers and everyone here. Thank you.